Greetings from Bermuda. I am the Honorable D. Nelitha I. Butterfield, MBE, JPMP, Minister of Culture and Social Rehabilitation for the Government of Bermuda. My ministry has overall responsibility for women's issues through the Department of Human Affairs, and we are eager and excited to participate in this workshop. We look forward to a constructive and valuable experience, gathering and sharing information, and eventually becoming a signatory to the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, as it is widely known. My staff has worked tirelessly to put together the following presentation, which will give you great insight as to what we are doing in Bermuda with respect to women's issues. I wish you all a productive and successful workshop and now present you with a perspective from Bermuda. Greetings, I am Deborah Bradford, Project Assistant from the Department of Human Affairs. Today, I will give you a brief overview of the history of women in Bermuda, discussing the historical framework of human rights and the fundamental freedoms of women. From as far back as the 16th century, Bermudian women have endeavored to gain equality and ensure the same rights and opportunities for themselves as their male counterparts. Having courage and resilience, women fought in the political, social, cultural, and civil society in an effort to gain self-worth and independence. With the scarcity of men by 1699, women became responsible for the overall management of their families, proving they had the same mental abilities and talents as men. Yet this sense of freedom and power was not formally recognized. Some researchers contend that Bermudian women failed to capitalize on their independence and wealth, and that it would not be until the 20th century that women would gain this recognition. With a gender imbalance due to the loss of so many men at sea, women in Bermuda were taxed heavily on their wealth in an effort to save the island and raise money for the support of government. And while some women were unsupported by men and barred from working, they used their economic power selling slaves to earn money in extreme hardships to support themselves. Historian Elaine Foreman Crane pointed out that Bermudian women were expected to contribute to the community in cash, slave labor, or their own labor equivalent. The economic impact on women was clear, yet they remained on the back end of society, powerless without legislation to protect their human rights and basic freedoms. A cartoon publisher of Harper Magazine in 1859 mocked women and their plight for equality, suggesting, if women are equal, men are diminished and marginalized. The 1700s was a turning point with the Married Women's Conveyance Act, allowing women the right to dispose of their property without the consent of their husbands. However, under patriarchal rule, the Will Act of 1840 stripped married women of their right to make wills, and women were again forced to deal with the restrictive social structures. By the 18th century, Bermuda had its first women petition with 122 signatures, spearheaded by Anna Marie Otterbridge, a human rights activist who is said to have persuaded her father to propose the bill enfranchising women. And in 1923, the Bermuda Women's Suffrage Society was organized, followed by the first women to vote in 1944, the first women to be elected to a parish vestry in 1944, and the first women elected to the House of Parliament in 1948. Much has changed since then, and women in Bermuda have continued to participate in the legislative process seeking to implement change in the political, economic, and social arena. Our Shiro Dame Lois Brown Evans broke barriers. She fought tirelessly to eliminate racial discrimination to create a more equitable society that would benefit all Bermudians, not just a small group of elite bankers and merchants. She was Bermuda's first female lawyer, the first female opposition leader, and Bermuda's first attorney general. The gender gap is shifting slowly, and women are emerging as prominent leaders in Bermuda. Our current cabinet has three women. There are 16 female members of parliament, Approximately 262 women serve on government boards and 33 women serve as chairpersons of the boards. 
I'm also pleased to note that the very same parish councils who prohibited women in the 17th century now account for 56% female. So you see, leadership constitutes one of the most powerful sources of empowerment. Women in Bermuda still have a long way to go, but experience has shown us that gender equality requires strategic planning and intervention at all levels of the policymaking process. Today, numerous organizations are on the front line, paving the way for our future generations of leaders, creating a better environment for all women of Bermuda. Transformation requires the commitment of government and civil society to effectively legislate change towards the elimination of discrimination against women. Our society is shifting, our faces and backgrounds are global, yet the issues affecting women remain the same. It is against this backdrop that we are endeavoring to become a signatory to CEDAW. At this over the past decade, it has been a priority of the Bermuda government to identify and address the presence of discrimination against women within the laws of Bermuda, as has been so appropriately emphasized by the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Discrimination against women continues to be a very real and pervasive fact of life. Ridding our world of this discrimination requires a determined and sustained effort on the part of governments to identify and deal with instances of discrimination against women in all areas of society. To that end, in its 2001 throne speech, the government of Bermuda committed itself to a review of Bermuda's legislation with the goal of identifying any remaining provisions that discrimination against women and making amendments that would pave the way for the convention to be extended to Bermuda. Between 2003 and 2006, the Attorney General's Chambers undertook a comprehensive review of the approximately 1,700 Bermuda Acts and statutory instruments with the goal of singling out any provision that was explicitly discriminatory against women. The first stage of the review began with a search for gender-specific words such as women, wife, and men. Approximately 50 provisions were identified within 21 acts and statutory instruments. The second stage was an analysis of those 50 provisions to determine whether they had the effect of discrimination against women. In order to make this determination, the Convention's definition of discrimination was broken down into four distinct elements and 50 provisions were compared against each element. For the provision to be considered discriminatory against women, all four elements needed to be present. In other words, the provision had to, one, be an inequality caused by either a distinction, exclusion, or restriction, two, the distinction, exclusion, or restriction had to, three, impair or nullify the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise of a woman's human rights or fundamental freedom, and four, the human right or fundamental freedom had to be in one of the various fields provided by the convention, for example, in the political field, the legal field, the civil field, and several others. Completion of this analysis revealed that 13 of approximately 50 provisions contained all four elements of the convention's definition. This type of review and analysis could not, however, identify legislation which, although having the effect of discrimination, did not contain any of the gender-specific words. As a result, the Attorney General's Chambers considered that it needed to look beyond ostensibly discriminatory laws and decided that a further review was required based more on the method of law reform. This will be discussed further in Jane Brett's presentation, which follows. The review and analysis did, however, bring to fore a number of significant legislation which, though containing inequalities, may require further policy consideration. Among these were the Bermuda Immigration and Protection Act of 1956 and a very old act entitled the Inheritance Act of 1835. In the Inheritance Act, there is a precedence of the paternal line of descendants over the maternal line. The Bermuda Immigration and Protection Act of 1956 could be considered discriminatory against Bermudian women who had married non-Bermudian men. For example, the act imposes conditions on the non-Bermudian husband of a Bermudian wife with respect to him landing, remaining, and residing in Bermuda, which it does not impose on the non-Bermudian wife of a Bermudian husband. This review and the discussion it generated between the various ministries and Bermuda's cabinet provided valuable insights into the legal and social nature of gender discrimination and a deeper understanding of what was needed to bring Bermuda in line with the convention. 
In 2007, the Attorney General's Chambers drafted a bill seeking to amend these provisions. However, after further consideration, it was felt that the proposed bill did not go far enough. It did not completely address the goals set out under the convention. It did not give full expression to Bermuda's commitment to end discrimination against women. We look forward to receiving some un input from this workshop as to how our objectives can be best achieved. The Bermuda government, in its commitment to eradicate discrimination against women, recognizes the need to build momentum and to carry this important initiative forward. As this decade closes and a new one dawns, it is important to recognize the responsibility we have to future generations to lead by example and to take positive steps to deal with discrimination against women and rid the world of it. The government of Bermuda is proud to contribute to such a worthy goal and we will continue to do so in the future.